The Institute of World Affairs at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee presents International Focus, a weekly discussion of the people and events behind today's global headlines. Support provided by Milwaukee Public Television and the UWM Center for International Education. Now here's your host, Doug Savage. Welcome to International Focus. In the wake of the Euro crisis and the Great Recession, governments around the world embraced austerity as their go-to economic policy prescription. More than half a decade on, results of this collective belt tightening have been mixed at best. Yet austerity continues to have its adherence both here and abroad. Our guests today have examined both the economics and ideology of austerity and are here to provide a look at its impact and its alternatives. James Galbraith is a noted economist and author who currently holds senior faculty positions at both the Lyndon B. Johnson School of Public Affairs and Department of Government at the University of Texas at Austin. He's also a senior scholar with the Levy Economics Institute of Bard College and a member of the Executive Committee of the World Economics Association. Yanis Varoufakis is Professor of Economic Theory and Director of the Political Economy Program at the University of Athens. He currently holds a visiting professorship at the LBJ School of Public Affairs at the University of Texas. And Jeffrey Summers is Associate Professor at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee and visiting faculty at the Stockholm School of Economics in Riga. He currently serves as Senior Fellow at the Institute of World Affairs. Uh, welcome, everyone, to International Focus. Thank you. Well, I'm wondering if uh, we could start with uh, sort of a basic description of what adherence, both for and against the policy of austerity, might say uh, on their respective behalfs. So first of all, what, what would austerians say is uh, the value and wisdom of pursuing that kind of program? And I'll throw it open to anyone who wants to take a swing at it. Well, I think the adherents of austerity, of course, would argue that just as a household would reduce their expenditures during a time of economic crisis, so must the public sector. And in so doing, get their financial balance sheet back in order and thus relaunching them on a period of prosperity and economic growth. So that's more or less the, the simple argument that's advanced for austerity. And those opposed? Well, put very simply, there's a fundamental difference between a household and an economy or a federal government. The difference is that uh, when it comes to the household, to you and me, our income is usually independent of our expenditure. So if we economize tonight by not going out to eat at a restaurant, our income does not suffer. But from the level of a, a macroeconomy, if everybody tries to deleverage at once, everybody tries to save at once, if especially in the international economy or in, in Europe, all governments try to economize to cut down on their deficits simultaneously, incomes suffer, the uh, precipitous fall, and the result is that the government doesn't have enough tax taxes from which to finance itself. So instead of reducing its debt and its deficits, it finds itself at th their level, at, at least in proportion to national income, to overall income, has actually increased. So maybe uh, you could take this, James. What, what is sort of the intellectual lineage of this way of thinking? Oh, of the austerity caucus? It, this is not a new thing. The principal intellectual lineage of it is a hostility to uh, social insurance programs, to uh, collective economic security of all types, uh, and to the entire structure of, of let's say, a public-private mixed economy uh, that was built up in the 20th century. So we're basically talking here about a desire to return to a world that uh, existed before the Great Depression uh, and which was in many ways a very harsh and very brutal world. 
So is it largely reactive then? I mean, did we see any anything approaching sort of this this policy prescription prior to the mid 20th century, New Deals or 1930s? When you have a government that has no alternative but to curtail its expenditures in harsh times, then they will do so. And that's going to be true at the local level, for example, in the United States, as well as for small countries in, uh, uh, in a large continental economy like Europe. Bigger countries, bigger entities do have an alternative. They can stabilize their own situation. The United States as a whole not only can, but has done so. And so the situation is very different. And that's an essential distinction, which uh, Yanis was just calling attention to. If I may add a wrinkle to what Professor Dalbray said, which mm -hmm. is absolutely, utterly correct. Even within this context, uh, you can have small countries that can react quite differently in the aftermath of a major economic crisis. Like, for instance, after 2008, compare and contrast Ireland with Iceland. They were both the small countries, both over-leveraged banking sectors that collapsed following the events of 2008. But see, look at the, the, the vast difference in responses. In Ireland, you had the taxpayer taking upon, upon himself or herself billions and billions and billions worth of loans on behalf of the failed banking system and then having the government trying to squeeze the living daylights out of the, out of the taxpayer in order to maintain this pretense. Whereas in Iceland, it was the banking sector that suffered most of the costs through effectively allowing them to fail. And there was very little austerity. So even within um, the realm of smaller countries, you can have different responses. It depends who is being asked to pay the bill that somebody else, especially the private sector in, the, in finance, has created. Let me come back to something you said at the beginning when you remarked that the record was at best mixed. I think that was an exceptionally generous mm. interpretation of the facts. I think the reality is that uh, one can point and people do point to the occasional case where a country applied an austerity policy and was then rescued by, for example, a strong drop in its currency and a revival of its export sector. But the overwhelming majority of the cases of harsh austerity are economically and socially catastrophic. Uh, and of course, the great example of that, the premier example of that, but by no means the only one uh, in the world today is Greece, uh, where social institutions are essentially being demolished in the name of austerity, and you have essentially no incentive being created to foster investment or growth, no recovery of international competitiveness. What you basically have is a certain amount of myth-making associated with a continuing underlying social decline and collapse. And that is what is going to be the characteristic case, whether one is talking about Greece or about Wisconsin or any other application of this policy. They fall very heavily on the most vulnerable populations and on social institutions which were already stressed uh, by the crisis. So they don't make a, a local, a small economy, a state economy, or a small country economy a more attractive place to invest. Well, I'll just add one more point, actually, to that, uh, Doug, before you uh, continue with your question. The other thing that we need to consider is that we are losing untold millions of hours of labor. So in other words, by pursuing this austerity agenda, which ostensibly is being done for the purpose of improving our economy, and just looking at an economy in a very kind of basic, simple way, uh, an economy is a system in which you have many laborers contributing wealth through the production of goods and services. Through austerity, what we see is all of this labor being retracted, withheld from the market. So rather than, as you know, economists have often thought that you have these uh, immutable laws, such as Say's Law in operation, which more or less states that uh, if the cost of labor sinks low enough, there will be a demand for it. 
historically in demand side crises, we have not seen that be the case. So the wages can drop and there's still not uh, enough demand for that labor when everyone is cutting their costs. So you know, think about uh, you know, some of the infrastructure that has been built historically, the Great Pyramids, for example. You know, think of the tens of thousands of uh, labor hours and years that went into the construction of something like that. We currently have in Europe and the United States something on the order of many fold Great Pyramids that are not being built. You know, whether it be in the form of schools, highways, trains, etc., through the withholding of all of this labor because of these austerity policies. So we're losing wealth, not gaining it. Well, I'd like to uh, touch on a, a place where you do a fair amount of work. Uh, Latvia had often been put forward as sort of the poster child of, see, it actually works. Right. What kind of criteria do people point to to make that argument if, if in fact, the, the results are actually much more dire and dismal than that? Sure. Well, they were actually able to stabilize their economy in terms of their financial system. But that took a, a very, very large loan from the European Central Bank and the IMF. So they had this external financing. But also, they had a, a state that was very divided based on ethnic lines, ethnic Russian, ethnic Latvian. And so rather than the population taking out their frustrations against these austerity policies, they took them out on each other. And by default, this just left the Austerians in charge to, to make policy. But the other chief um, factor that was at play here was that because that country is so small, roughly about two million people, a significant percentage of that population could simply pull up stakes and leave, go and work elsewhere because there was really very little work at home. Now, if you extend that logic to, say, a country like the United States, if you applied austerity on that scale here, you would have to find something like a place for 30 million of our workers abroad. And the last time I checked, uh, Mexico and Canada are in no position to take up to 30 million of our laborers. So the conditions were quite unique and cannot be replicated in another context. So we've got just a few minutes before our break, and, and that will not be nearly adequate time, but uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about how uh, a nation's position in something like the EU impacts its ability to respond to this kind of thing. And, and with understanding this will be just a very initial introductory few remarks before our break, what do you think? How, how is it different to be a sovereign nation who have uh, tools at their disposal versus Greece? Well, let me give a very brief example from this country. Imagine that this country, the dollar zone, was structured like the eurozone. Uh, it would have collapsed by now. It would have been in a kind of state in which Spain and Italy finds itself for the very simple reason. Imagine you know, the, the good state of Wisconsin or the state of Nevada having in after 2008 to borrow internationally at commercial rates in order to bail out the banks that were domiciled in this state and at the same time pay for the unemployment benefits and the social security pen benefits that would have to rise significantly following the increase in unemployment and so on and so forth, without the central bank uh, having the back of the state government and without and the FDIC, the, the top, uh, the, the Federal Reserve and so on, providing liquidity to the banking sector. What would have happened is your state would have gone uh, under, it would have become insolvent, the private sector would have uh, found itself in, in, a, in a situation that would be described as the grapes of wrath, and, and that, that, that would then trigger similar uh, phenomena, similar events in neighboring states until the whole of the United States would resemble the Eurozone. And to put it another way, we did have a dollar zone that resembles the Indeed. current Eurozone, and it did collapse, exactly. and that was called the Great Depression, and the remedy was to create the institutions of the New Deal, later the Great Society, which bound the country together in a self-supporting way. And this is precisely what is not uh, the case in the Eurozone inside the European Union. Indeed. And the worst thing is that 
our, our 1929 in Europe, which is 2008, 2010, has not given rise to a political impetus that will create the institutions that were created under the New Deal and the Great Society. Mm -hmm. If anything, our political systems in Europe are now fragmenting and uh, the centrifugal forces that are detrimental to any such developments in Europe seem to be underway. Well, I'd like to talk a little bit about sort of the relationship between the politics and the economics at when we come back. But first, we'll take a short break. We'll be right back with more International Focus. The Institute of World Affairs presents our community with a range of public programs relating to global issues, U.S. foreign policy, and the world economy. For more information about the Institute of World Affairs, call 414 229-3220 or visit our website at www.iwa.uwm.edu Welcome back. We're discussing austerity and its alternatives with James Galbraith, Yanis Varoufakis, and Jeff Summers. So, uh, before we uh, left, we were talking a little bit about that intersection between the politics of various states and the, uh, the economic policy. And let's look at someone like uh, Angela Merkel, who is uh, certainly on the austerian side of, of the spectrum. I think most people would agree. She still has to face the German electorate. And uh, how is her situation different than a politician elsewhere? And is, is Elective office in Germany particularly hard these days? Well, Angela Merkel is by all accounts the most capable leader in the European Union. She's also electorally the most successful. So if there were ever a uh, political leader in Europe who had the objective capacity to change uh, as circumstances demand, it, it is it is she. Uh, they're already you can see this inside the process of coalition forming uh, in the uh, in in Germany itself. Now the question is, does she have any interest or any reason to try and save the eurozone and the European Union by changing the policy of the critical state towards the uh, uh, states which are presently uh, in a nearly disastrous, uh, in a essentially disastrous situation. So far, there's no evidence of that. And the reason for that is that, uh, well, apart from her own views, which are impossible really to know in depth. She is surrounded uh, by a cadre of advisors who have become uh, uh, habitualized to taking a very hard line. She has the interests of the banks, uh, which remain essentially a, a black box of, of, of rotten assets and <laughs> difficulties. Uh, and she has to keep, the, the, she constantly has to be, uh, is I'm sure reminded that if she makes a concession to save one country, those concessions would spread all over the uh, Eurozone and then where would we be? So it's, uh, we do not see in her an incipient Franklin Roosevelt. Well, and, and what about that? I mean, is, is part of this driven by this perception that the profligates need to be punished and we're hardworking and we turn well, up at the BMW plant every day, so why should we finance? Let me take that up along the same lines of Professor <laughs> Galbraith's answer. Chancellor Merkel is um, the victim of her own inability to look at the German voter in the eye and tell him or her the truth. After the financial sector collapse in 2008, her government appeared in front of the federal parliament and requested about 500 billion um, uh, dollars, 350 billion euros, uh, for the purposes of uh, propping up the financial sector, just like it happened here. And just like it happened in Washington, uh, there was a lot of furor. In the end, that was passed. When the Eurozone started fragmenting, beginning with Greece and Ireland, Portugal and so on and so forth, it, it turned out, of course, that the large banks like Deutsche Bank, Finance Bank, were still full of uh, uh, black holes, this time populated by uh, the, the debt, the, the bonds of these European member states. 
they had really stacked up massively on them. As the value of those bonds were coming down, you know, the big black holes that were supposed to have been gap, uh, filled by, by means of these 500 billions reappeared. And Mrs. Merkel did not have what it takes to go back to the federal parliament and ask for more money. So instead, she went back to the federal parliament and asked for money for Greece, for Ireland, for Portugal. These were predatory loans given to these countries. These countries were bankrupt and they could never repay them. So they were forced effectively on the basis of European solidarity to bail out the profligate, supposedly, uh, member states of the periphery, what happened was a very vulgar and sinister transfer of losses from the books of Deutsche Bank and Finance Bank onto the shoulders of the German taxpayer. And Mrs. Merkel never told the German taxpayer that. And once she failed to say that, she was locked into this conundrum. Beyond that, now, four years later, she's facing another political constraint regarding the process of fixing the Eurozone and creating the institutions that we don't have. And that is the following. At the moment, so far, every time she walks into a European Union summit and there is the French president, the prime ministers of, of, of Spain, Italy, and so on and so forth. No one speaks a word, especially the French president. Why? Because the French president, whoever the, pres the French pre president might, might be, Mr. Sarkozy, Mr. Hollande, the next one, knows that uh, any breakup of the Eurozone will be absolutely catastrophic for France. F capital is going to flee France and go straight into Frankfurt, whereas it will not be catastrophic for Germany. Germany will suffer, but not as much as France will. So the French president never speaks his mind. We know that Mr. Hollande has very different views to, to Chancellor Merkel, and yet he never speaks those views in the European Union summit. So Mrs. Merkel knows that this, the possibility of fragmentation gives the office of German Chancellor an enormous amount of bargaining power vis-à-vis -vis the rest. So the austere logic and this uh, complete commitment to maintaining the, the policies of austerity and bailouts is not at all independent of the feeling that Ms. Mrs. Merkel has that she's obliged, she has a moral duty to the office of Chancellor not to diminish its bargaining power vis-à-vis -vis Paris, which is of course exactly the same thing as saying that she has a moral duty not to fix the Eurozone and to allow for the fragmentation of the Eurozone and for austerity to be doing its evil deed under the surface. Well, uh, <coughs> as we run out of time. We've got several minutes left. Uh, we certainly should talk about what the alternatives are. And I, I know you, you've all written extensively on that. If, uh, if you were to wave your policy wand over the EU and, and actually to, to an extent for the U.S. as well, what is the alternative? Well, to a certain extent, I mean, I think what we need to address and what is being currently debated uh, in the United States, the income distribution profile of a country. And of course, this needs to be done in countries such as Germany as well, which we were just discussing. So uh, speaking of the kind of profligate uh, nature of Europe's periphery, as the Germans see them, we have to remember that it was the Germans themselves who created a profligate a periphery. In other words, they needed this. They needed export markets uh, for their goods. And they selected an economic model roughly some 10 years ago, that was based on wage suppression. Now, in order to uh, generate profits, uh, and if these goods were uh, not circulating within their country, they would have to circulate uh, out as exports. Now, we see something uh, similar in the United States as well. Uh, we need to generate more internal demand for the goods and services that we create. Uh, this could be done through legislative fiat with increasing the minimum wage. Um, but currently, of course, we see obstacles to this, both in the form of our current Congress, but some of our state legislatures, which are acting against this. So we see a, a lack of demand for the goods and services uh, that we produce. The most important thing that one can do for the economy as a whole, both in Europe and the United States, is to support the most vulnerable and weakest participants in that economy. The people who receive the social insurance schemes, who need the health insurance, who need, who rely on the public education system, and who do the worst jobs with the lowest pay.
Uh, and the most effective thing you can do in the present political climate, again, both in Europe and the United States, is to raise the minimum wage and to raise it by a very substantial amount. That would, first of all, bring money in to the circulating economy. It would uh, re take it from people who do not spend it and give it to people who do. It would improve the quality of people's lives at the uh, 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 at the low end of the of, of economic activity, it would improve the quality. It would improve the balance sheets of the businesses that serve those people, because their customers would have more money to spend. It would be the major stabilizing device that one can do without. Uh, rating, if you like, without increasing the public expenditures, which is extremely hard to do in the present political and ideological climate. Second most important thing is to have a discussion of this kind uh, and to lay the foundation for uh, deeper reforms. And I would just say that since we're in Wisconsin, that this state played the essential role in that respect with at the time of the, of the last Great Depression in this country and provided many of the fundamental ideas that built the social security system, unemployment insurance, and other core institutions on which we still rely today. So um, I would hope that there might still be, even in the state of Wisconsin, the capacity to regenerate, uh, to begin the regeneration of what was the, what were the great contribution of the, of the progressive era. Well, I'm afraid we're going to have to leave it there. James Galbraith. Yanis Varoufakis, thank you. Jeff Summers, thank you very much. To our viewers, we'll see you next time on International Focus. information about the Institute of World Affairs and its many programs, or to become a member of the Institute, call 414-229-3220, or visit us at our website, 